welcome to this video and on this video I'm going to be bringing to you 10 more awful album covers. Now there's some rules to this. I can't just go on the internet and pull out some any old awful album cover. There's billions out of there, usually by some weird Eastern European group or maybe some 1960s Christian band. You know, the sort of thing, you know, some woman sat there with ridiculous hair, cross eyes, you know, with the title, he touched me or something like that. You know, that all that stuff and they're very funny. No, I can only on this channel, um, talk about artists that are known to this channel that are either jazz artists or fusion artists or prog artists and maybe a rock artist, a few disco. They've got to be a proper artist. It should be by somebody who should know better. You know, people who don't know what they're doing, you know, with their awful album covers, we, we should leave those alone. On this, I'm going to explore awful album covers. And in, in this case, some quite famous album covers as well. Um, so shall we kick off? It's it's not rounds, but there's ten because we always like to have ten. It's a nice round number, right? So um, one of these lists cannot be complete without Herbie Mann. Herbie Mann is the guy in terms of awful album covers that keeps on giving. It's just there's so much there always on this list. I I, I cannot get to the bottom of um and 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 I, I don't want to use the word bottom because it is going to feature on this video but luckily on these two covers there is no sign of herbie man's bottom but they are still truly awful so number one on the list is this one our man flute by herbie man uh, now this <laughs> is not a photo of herbie man it's a painting of him and um, this has been commissioned by Atlantic Records. They, they have said to an artist, can we have a painting of Herbie Mann dressed like a secret agent playing his flute, but the flute has a telescopic, you know, telescopy thing on it, and it's firing a bullet. Now, The thing with Herbie Mann is, is because his surname is Mann, right, he f has felt the need to try and insert that in as a pun whenever he can. Now, everyone says sarcasm is the lowest form of wit. No, puns are the lowest form of wit. Now, the great Miles Davis had a, 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 a penchant for doing this, you know, of... of, of of making an album called something like Miles Out or Miles Beyond and all these type of things. Don't think he did any help. They're, they're too mavish new tracks. <laughs> but you know what I'm saying? That sort of pun. But with Herbie Mann, you could see it gets to a point where the puns, he's he's he, he's he's done all the you know, he's done all the obvious ones. You know, so what is this referring to? Our man <laughs> flute. Our man flute. Now, is there a is there a film with James Coburn, James Coburn in called Our Man Flint, which he, where he plays a sort of spoof James Bond? Is that right? Our Man Flint, or is it in like Flint? <laughs> I'm really trying to to I'm trying to get where this pun comes from our man i know there's our man in havana and that's like a secret agent thing yeah our man flint i was right 1966 our man flint and um this album which is our man flute was made in i'll get the date up um it was made in 1966 so we have worked it out we have got into the you know obscure obtuse mind of Herbie Mann here so his idea is to sort of you insert his name into a pun where instead of our man flint it's our man flute it's is this really worth it Herbie is it really worth the cost of the artist to come up with this cover you know just to crack that joke right the painting does not look like Herbie Mann right I mean, Herbie, Herbie Mann's got that great big long Jimmy Hill chin. If you don't know who Jimmy Hill is, because you're not British, then you'll have to look it up. But he's got that big long chin, hasn't he, with the beard on the end. And, and, and I mean, it's there, but it's, it's, it's too round and chubby. His lips are black. His lips are black like someone who's been asphyxiated. The whole thing is strange. 
right? His flute is a gun and it's got a telescopic lens and he's firing it, but he's not looking to, who would fire a gun sideways on like this? Right, it doesn't work. Whoever came up with this idea of one, you know, should we make the gun into a flute? Well, when you fire a, a gun, it goes straight on, but the flute goes sideways. Well, can't, can't you be firing it sideways? Well, yeah, but it's like, um, how would how would he, you know, see the target? Well, we put a telescopic lens on. Well, then you'll have to turn to the... Oh, no, we can't have that. We've got to Herb, have Herbie's face. He's fat, pudgy, asphyxiated, distorted face while he sits there in his Inspector Cluso bloody raincoat, you know, and he's got to look down like that, he's going to do that, you know, I mean, you can't actually look like that, just like, like that. The whole thing's ridiculous, and we, they have, they have um, frozen this at the moment of shooting. What is he shooting at? The whole thing is preposterous. Herbie Mann does it again. Absolutely awful. Now, we haven't got one Herbie Mann album on this list. We've actually got two. And the next one's not actually that bad. But I just thought I'd bring up sort of your average Herbie Mann album cover so you can see how truly awful these things are. So the next album I've got is called Man in the Morning. And there we have Herbie Mann in his bedroom with his pyjamas on, sat on his bed, playing some music he's just got out of bed and he's playing some music this is an early album now man in the morning now <laughs> that's not a pun is it <laughs> that's just he's in the morning right now um the thing that i i actually quite like this album cover it's not that bad i like the blue right um it, herbie man has not gone to the sort of 70s trademark you know Rolf Harris beardy thing and the hair and all that bit. He, he, he looks a lot more normal. Um, we've got some casually clothes, you know, th thrown clothes in the background. We've got that sort of light and he's, he's, you can see he's got some stuff on the table there. It's quite straightforward, but it's the pyjamas for me, right? The pyjamas, I, I, he, he has to wear pyjamas, right? But I, I, I'm not keen on the pyjamas. I, I, I think for a serious musician, this is not a good look. Now, the reason why I brought this in, because you're probably thinking, now, this is a bit weak, Andy. This, 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 this one's a bit weak. It's not that bad, really. You know, it's, it's pretty ridiculous. I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't pose on an album cover of mine like that. If I was making an album, you know, Andy in the morning, it would not have me sat on my bed in, in those stripy pyjamas. No way. No way. I'd, I'd be on the mountaintop and the sun would be coming up. It would be something like that, you know, something that made me look sort of, you know, mysterious and, and, and wise. Whereas Herbie Mann looks like a bit of an idiot here lying in bed playing his flute like that. But the reason why I brought that in is because I wanted to show you this cover, right, which takes the pyjamas theme and just pushes it into a sort of um, surreal space of insanity. And it is this album by Fred Katz. And it's called Fred Katz and His Music. And then we have a list of incredible musicians on this album. Fred Katz was, was, was one of the sort of... He, he, he's probably the greatest... He's probably the greatest cha jazz cellist of all time. He played in Chico Hamilton's band. A very serious player. Uh, you can see he's a very serious man. If you've, ever, if you've ever watched Jazz on a Summer's Day and there's that guy that's playing the cello... Uh, I think he's playing Bark and there's loads of cigarette smoke. That's Fred Katz. On here we've got like Buddy Collette, we've got Leroy Vinegar, we've got Billy Higgins, we've got Chico Hamilton. It's a great album. But this album cover, the thing, this is truly ridiculous. Right? Absolutely ridiculous. So here we have um, Fred Katz. Right? Now... If you look closely, he's actually wearing a stripy suit. He's not wearing his pyjamas, right? But it looks like he's wearing his pyjamas, right? And the shoes he's got on do not really go with those pyjamas. So it's, it seems like he, he has come down to the beach in his pyjamas. Maybe he's a little bit shy. He doesn't want to put his trunks on. And so he's kept his pyjamas on because they're light and airy and he's sat on this rock. And... This is where well, he's on a beach, he's sat on the rock, he's playing the cello. He looks very intellectual with his glasses, you know, and he looks very sort of, um, you know, um, what's it? Um, <laughs> he looks very intellectual. But 
staring at him is this blonde girl in a sort of, you know, little swimsuit, right? And she looks sort of enamoured by this man in those shoes with the striped pyjamas playing the cello. And she's looking at him in a very pro provocative way, right? In a pose that nobody ever would normally stand in, gazing at him. Now, my question is, what has this got to do with Fred Katz and his music? What has it got to do? This is truly awful. Um, <laughs> Uh, why stick that girl, the, 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 this desperate attempt to lure listeners into the music of Fred's cats with a bit of cheesecake, with a bit of a leg, you know, with a bit of blonde girl, you know, it's just truly awful. So um, I'm going to move on from this. Just look at it, though. And the thing, the thing that I find really upsetting on this it's the shoes and those white socks and then the stripy trousers. I find it terrible. Right, so what we got next on the list? So next on the list I have... Um, right, we talked about bottoms earlier on. And... Um, what the hell has this album here... Why, why do I have to look at that bottom? I've asked myself this for years and years. So yes, the great yes, with the incredible Roger Dean, with those incredible covers that they did, which are all part of the experience, right? In 1977, after sort of um, taking a little bit of a break, you know, they've all gone off and done solo albums, and they all reconvene. Right, they chick they chuck Patrick Moraz out because they want to get Rick Wakeman back in. And Rick Wakeman does come back in and give the band a good kick up the arse and they make this album go for the one, which I think could well be Yes's greatest album. I truly believe that side two is the greatest side on a progressive rock album. We have Wondrous Stories, which is prop at its most whimsical and accessible, and Pop is a little pop song, it's brilliant. And then we have Awaken, the greatest epic of all time. Side one is sublime, and side two isn't far off as well. This is a mind-blowing prog album, right? The reason why I think it's not perceived as the massive triumph in the year of punk, and this was a big selling album, the massive triumph, right? If, if it hadn't have had this cover, this album could have come out and stood there strong, waving the flag for progressive rocks, going <laughs> to all the music critics that were going on about punk. It could have done this, but they let us down, not with the music, but with this ridiculous cover. Now, um, what we have here is this man is, has walked into this sort of city full of these sort of skyscrapers. And this, 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 and this album cover, I think it's by Hypnosis. I haven't checked because I didn't want to do any research for this nonsense. But I think it's by Hypnosis. And Hypnosis, you know, they make incredible album covers. What the hell was going on here? What is going on? Why is this man walking naked through a sort of forest of modernity what does it mean and then he's got all these sort of graphic shapes that are sort of coming out in his head now the thing that that um <laughs> i don't know whether you lot out here have got the same thought right but for me with relaya we have this incredible keyboardist join the band patrick moraz he's incredible and he brings them another level of virtuosity he brings the jazz in and relaya is incredible and then they kick him out. But when I was a kid and I was getting into Yes and I bought this album, I assumed, and I don't know why, that that was Patrick Moraz, that that naked man was Patrick Moraz, that they had sent him naked off into this, this sort of, you know, modern hellhole. Right? Now, I want to ask the question, how many of you out there also thought that that was Patrick Moraz? Now, we're going to get two answers here. Are they going to get people going, yes, I thought that, Andy, and you've actually stated it on the video, now we've got it out there. We all think that that's Patrick Moraz. Is it Patrick Moraz? If it is Patrick Moraz, he has, he's a, he's a, he's a very 
toned man, isn't he? He's, 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 he's got nothing to be ashamed of there. But I just, I don't want to see it. I don't like it. I really don't like it. Um, and But if it is Patrick Moraz, right, maybe they say, Patrick, you know, um, we really love you we, and we want you on the next album cover. We want to put you in. But, you know, um, Steve Howe won't do it and, um, you know, Chris Squire won't do it. You know, none of, them, none of the lads will do it. But you're the new guy. Is there any chance that you could, uh, you know, just get the old pants off and get on, you know, get on the album cover? And then once they cajoled him into doing this, they kicked him out of the band. Rick Wakeman wasn't going to show his ass on their album cover. No way. All these are the thoughts that they have around this album cover. I do not understand what yes we're up to with this. It ruins this album. Right? If this album had a cover like Relayer on the front, we would be saying this is one of their greatest albums. The, honestly, I'm telling you now, the cover has made everyone think this album's not as good as it actually is. They let themselves down with this. It's truly crap and what are these big graphic-y shapes coming out of his head what does that represent and if and this is fundamentally the problem i have with this if you were a naked man that was going to wander into some you know you know a modern city of of skyscrapers like that in in the nude like that like he has like patrick Murath here how is that going for the one what are you doing when you're going for the one what is he up to? This is, it's just, I mean, the hypnosis at this point, I just think they got to a point where they were able to extract huge budgets to just come up with anything they felt they wanted to do, you know. Now, the next album relates to this. Because the next album is another awful use of the bare male bottom by a progressive rock band. And it's, of course, that awful hemispheres hemispheres now here what we have and i've used this because i hate this i hate this is the fact that i talk about this sort of binary this sort of um that this 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 um idea of the way that human beings break the universe down into two you know complementary parts like male and female and they relate to the sort of dionysian of you know sort of chaos and order of emotions against rationalism and all that and it's really personified in this album this is what this album's about hemispheres and it relates to the two hemispheres of the brain right and on this album rush have really shown that literally so we have some sort of metaphorical space which represents the sort of um a, a sort of platonic space i suppose and we have an actual brain and on that brain we see a naked man dancing now of course this naked man is the naked man on 2112 he's the person that stands up against authority so there's a conceptual continuity but on 2112 he's graphically rendered and the bottom you can sort of ignore but here we've got the actual naked man right now he is gesturing in a very effete way to some like English man who has got a walking stick and a bowler hat and I think he he represents the rational and uh, this guy here with no clothes on is 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 referencing the sort of um, emotional I think and so we, we and we, it does it beautifully illustrates the idea of this binary it does but the trouble is it's truly awful Right, and I'm now going to tell you why I think it's so awful. Graphically, it's not that well done, is it? You know, we've got sort of airbrush background, and then we've got these two people cut out. Uh, the brain looks like it's been cut out of a magazine and stuck on with a bit of Pritt stick, right? And then we have this naked man. And when I, again, I don't know why I do this with naked men, but where I assume that that guy was um, Patrick Moraz on the Going for the One album, here... This is, but when's this album made? 1978. I thought that was Mark Hamill from Star Wars. I thought it was Luke Skywalker. You know, when I bought this album as a kid, I said, why, why have they got Luke, Luke Skywalker on, on the album cover? Now, I've got to state this, because I always, it always, I always think this when I look at this album cover. When I see Patrick Moraz, I'm going for the one, his actual bottom, although I don't want to look at it, is aesthetically pleasing. It's, it, it's a good bottom. This guy has got a very puny bottom. Only Rush 
would would there's just there's just no weight to that bottom at all. It's it's a weak bottom. It 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 is just it it's so he's so the last thing. If you're if you're in like a, a heavy metal fan that has got into Rush and you like the fact that they're prong intellectual but they got some heavy riffs, they're a rock band. We don't want to see this bloke pantsing about on front of the album cover, and he's gesturing. He's gesturing to this this bloke who's like sort of this repressed Englishman with his bowler hat and his walking stick. What, why what, what why is he gesturing? It doesn't seem to illustrate fundamentally when you really look at it. It doesn't illustrate the idea of this binary. It's it 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 it, it it's about this repressed uh, the, the repressed homosexual feelings of an English, you know, office worker that really what's he wants to go wants to go and he he wants to go and dance off with this this man with the little bottom off into the world, you know, he's gesturing to him, he's being lured like a siren. Right, he's a gay siren to this sort of repressed English, and all these things do not fit with hemispheres. All these things, oh, my ear's itching now. And, you know, it, it, it just doesn't seem to add up, it doesn't add up. I've got to give um, that Rush logo, I think, that Rush is the best one of all the different Rush logos, that's my favourite one. I used to like that because I could draw that on my exercise book because it is sort of a sort of drawn look. But, but so that that logo's good and, and, and that's but it's absolute rubbish. When you open it up and you look on the back, then we have these floating brains that are so badly graphically done. It's rubbish. It's strange. What possessed these bands to go with the naked bottom, right? I mean, back in the 70s, bottoms were really still seen as being something that you didn't want to show children. Uh, and I still think that's the case. You know, I don't want my kids to be looking at male naked bottoms. So, you know, you put this album into Double H Smith, you know, and it's like, you know, the kids are walking in there and they're looking around. They go, what the hell's that? Is a bare bottom? What's in a bare bottom? Right, that's just going to elicit giggles from young children when they see this. I don't want them to see this. Rush. That, and again, Hemispheres is a brilliant album. On Farewell to Kings, they did a ridiculous cover. That cover is absolutely brilliant. It's just so brilliant. Permanent Waves is a brilliant album. What, what went wrong with this? Who, who, it wasn't Hypnosis again, was it? Because if it was, you could tell by 1978, they've done Wish You Were Here, they've done Dark Side of the Moon, they've got a ton of money, and they think they can do whatever they want. And all they're interested in is male bottoms, but I don't know if it is Hypnosis. Okay, can I can I quickly find the album here? I doubt I can. Oh yeah, yeah. But I could. I found Farewell to Kings. I'll pull that one out. Look, now this is a cover. That that's a cover. Look at that beauty. And there, that's brilliant. And then we can see, you know, classic Rush, proper Rush, when Neil Peart's got the big moustache. You know, there he is in their sort of English mansion. You know, that, that is a great album, but the idea that I'm going to be able to find Hemisphere is this quick. Oh, you know, I, I, I'll, I'll have a, a quick scan and then I will fail. Um, oh, there is this one here. See, Lalo Schifrin did an album called Tower in Takata. And he, he's got those sort of, I mean, these are, the, these are the Twin Towers. They're the going for the one skyscrapers, isn't it? But there, he's managed to keep his clothes on. You know, I mean, they've got exactly the same photo back and front. That's a cheat, but it is a gatefold. You get Lalo there looking, looking uh, whimsical, pensive. I ain't going to be able to find it. Shall I move on? But you got to see something, didn't you? It's better than seeing nothing. Right, let's move on to the next horror. Right, what have we got on the list? Right, so the next one. <laughs> oh my god! Oh, you're going to think on this video that I have a problem with the 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 male body. You're going to think I don't like. It. I haven't got a problem with the male body. 
It's just his use on album because it's very questionable. So um, the next album, I've got an album by the great Michael Henderson. Michael Henderson was the bass player with Miles Davis. He's on Jack Johnson and he's on all, you know, like um, Live Evil. He's a monster funky bass, but a really great bass player. And we love Michael Henderson. Later on, he started making sort of disco records and he had some hit records. And in the, in the, in the late 70s, he made this album called Slingshot and it looks like this. Now, um, what can I say about this cover? Um, it's I I'm, I'm I, I did I did a I did a series called when jazz musicians take their shirt off and uh, this um, cover I didn't even find it and then looking here I came across this and this is this is a uh, he, he's well, he's on his beach he's in his trunks he's putting his coat on he's having a good time you know he, he, he's he's I mean, he's got a good body, Michael Henderson. He wants to show it off. But those trunks are small, aren't they? And they, they don't really leave anything to the imagination, which is okay. I mean, we're all right with that. He wants to go on the front. I wouldn't do it. Again, I would not do it. I question why he's done this, you know. Is, is, is he after sort of some sort of sex symbol statement? Does he want the ladies to go, whoa, look at that there. Look at that, and look at his trunks. Oh, that's good, isn't it? That, I, mean, I mean, what's Michael Henson after with this? I mean, it's all very questionable. But the thing I don't like is he's called the album Slingshot. And I don't like how that word Slingshot and that album cover work together. I can't see the relation of the word Slingshot and that album cover. I mean, shall, 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 we, shall we see what slingshot means? Let's look it up as a definition. So slingshot definition. Right, I'm typing it into the old, right? And it says a fork stick to which an elastic strap or pair of elastic bands connected by a small sling is fastened to two prongs typically used to shooting small stones. Right, now yeah, of course, um, in the UK we call that a catapult. We don't call it a slingshot. What has this got to do with him on the beach in those tiny trunks? But there's another meaning of slingshot, the effect of the gravitational pull of a celestial object in accelerating and changing the course of an other object or spacecraft. Again, I can't see the link. But, and, and because I can't think the link, I think my, my brain fills it in in a way I don't want it to. Right, shall we move on? I, I, I don't want to talk about that one anymore. Right, so what's next on my list? So the next one on the list is, I, th I think, I hope we have got past the sort of male nudity. Um, um, and we are now on to this album cover. See, I have to pull it up so I can see it. This album cover by Count Basie. It's an album called Super Chief. Now, here in the UK, we have, uh, we used to have a TV series um, called, um, <laughs> It was narrated by Ringo Starr and it was called Thomas the Tank Engine. Um, now, um, in that, it was populated by these different trains that had faces on the front of them. Um, now, here we have, you know, back in the 50s, 60s, because I've got no idea when this album's made. Here we have Count Basie pioneering this idea on this album cover. Again, this is a painting. It's It's been... It's been commissioned by the record company and it shows um, Count Basie as a train plowing his way through the American, you know, landscape. Um, the guy's actually signed it and it's a guy called Willardson. Willardson. That's the guy who's painted this. It's, it's, he's, a very, he's very nifty with the old airbrush, this guy. And it's, there's a lot of airbrush work there. It's competently done. But for me, I cannot look at that without looking at Thomas the Tank Engine. And to see Count Basie's sort of face, you know, his red face on the front, front of this train. Now, I think I could stomach this one if... 
I understood the train reference. Now maybe Super Chief, I mean what does Super Chief mean? Um, and this is where those British people, there's, I think there's certain American things that we don't quite get, right? There's a lot of American things we don't get. Um, so I've looked up Super Chief and I've Googled it. Oh my God! The Super Chief was one of the named passenger trains and the flagship of the Atchison, Topeka and Santa Fe Railway, right? And I'm looking at a photograph and, and I can see why it's called Super Chief now. Ah, so he, he, it's a very specific train that he's being here, Count Basie. Um, why? <laughs> this isn't that bad, but it is pretty strange, is it? I mean, why would you come up with this idea? But anyway, um, it's not that bad. Now, I, I, the thing that upset me, I just couldn't understand it. Being British and not knowing about these Super Chief trains and knowing the sort of... Um, people who watch this channel of a certain age, they're going to be up in arms. Andy, did you know there's a train called a Super Chief? You didn't know. And now I know that. It, it doesn't seem so bad. Right? Um, so, um, I, I, I think what upset me was the fact that his face was red. And when I saw the, the um, word Chief, I, I, I was thinking in terms of sort of Native American. And I didn't like, you know, the sort of, he's, he, that that look at all I didn't think it was right but now I understand it I, I, I wish I hadn't put this one up now and now I've found out about it um, you know it's uh, it might be best to do a little bit of research when I do these videos every now and then but I like, I like to react to what's going on I like to react that ca the count yeah, yeah you're not this isn't so bad count count Basie I mean it's, I, I wouldn't do it but it's not so bad so what we got on the next list on the next one on the list this one is truly bad right so um this is by the great Jimmy Smith, right? And it's an album called, right? And I just need to pull this up because I've got, there we go. It's called Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf? And it shows Jimmy Smith by a tree holding hands with <laughs> this lady who has, I think it's supposed to be a wolf's head. It doesn't look like a wolf, it looks more like a jaguar. And if we look at the eyes, the eyes are cross-eyed. Now, um, Jimmy Smith is one of the great, he's probably the greatest jazz organist of all time. He's a serious musician. He signed to Verve Records. Verve Records don't usually do stuff like this. What the hell were they thinking? Because this is just strange. He's got a lovely yellow suit on. He's got a black scarf on. He, he, he's, um, I mean, just look at it. Look at that wolf. It's not a wolf, right? Now, who's afraid of Virginia Woolf? It, it, it's a film that came out. We can see the 1960s. You can see these jazz artists trying to look on, you know, jump on the back of a, a film. Maybe that he's done a, a, an organ version of the theme music, and that's pulled people in. But um, Virginia Woolf, who was a, 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 a very depressing author, right, was not a wolf, right? She's not a wolf. Look at the spelling. It's not that type of wolf, right? And so the intellectual aspects of this film and the references in it, it Jimmy Smith shows he has no understanding of that whatsoever because he has then gone well here I am with Virginia Woolf and he's brought that writer down to just a lady with a wolf's head but it's not a wolf's head it's a jaguar's head and he's cross-eyed and he's holding hands with her and he's looking around at her not with love just with a sort of um you know um acceptance he's trying to show he's not He's not afraid of Virginia Woolf, the wolf woman. He's not afraid of her at all. She's stuck there looking very elegant. She's got some nice white gloves on, but she does have that head. It's absolute. What possesses someone to do this? And how do they think that someone walk in a record shop? Right, if you know Jimmy Smith, you're going to buy the album. But say you didn't know Jimmy Smith. Oh, what's this? Oh, I saw that. Who's afraid of Virginia Woolf? I like that film. It's really good. Um, what? <laughs> it's just stupid. Right, I'm going to move on. Let's move on. We're nearly through this now. Right, um, we're going to, uh, I'm going to, this is sacrilegious, I'm going to pull up one of the most famous album covers in history. 
than it is by Black Sabbath Paranoid. <laughs> so, this album is the second album by Black Sabbath. It was originally going to be called War Pigs. All right? So they're going to call it War Pigs, so they decide to, to you know, come up with a photo shoot. Now, the, 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 the cover of um, the, the original Black Sabbath album, the first one, is an incredible album cover. And it says everything about heavy metal that an album cover should. They invent the genre. They go down to this old creepy house somewhere and they get this creepy woman and they stick her in front of it and it's just absolutely brilliant. Now, um, I'm pretty sure that, the, you know, with um, they were signed to NEMS, weren't they? So I don't know what the budgets were like for these album covers. So they'd obviously gone down with the camera, got this girl they knew, stuck her in front of the thing, photographed it, then they treated it and made it look all gothic. And it's absolutely brilliant. And... But I do feel with that first album cover, there's, there's a touch of the homemade about it. The, the, the album that comes in after this, which is uh, Masters of Reality, has just got the awful, truly awful purple cover that's black and purple, with purple right, it's just, it's just crap. And then they follow that with Volume 4, which is um, just, again, a truly awful album cover. So, you know, um, I don't think they had the vision on on the following albums, they fluked it with the first one. Now this one here, they've decided, remembering that this, this album is going to be called War Pigs, they've decided to go down with their mates and try and in photographic form represent the idea of a war pig. Right, so um, they've got their friend and they have made him, it looks like, take his trousers off so he's in his blue pants right they have made him a shield that looks unlike any shield that's ever existed historically and it's just a <laughs> red shield with a black dot they have got a pantomime sword which looks like an arabic sort of you know if the curve of that you know that that's a plastic sword they have stuck a crash helmet on him and they have put on him a sash the sort of sash that miss world would wear <laughs> and said you go into that behind that tree and jump out and you look at the look on the guy's face the whole thing is just absolutely awful and then the icing on the cake is that they then go oh we've got a single called paranoid now we didn't expect to do that because you know the story you know they made the album and the record company said can you just knock off a quick track you know quickly because we need another song on there just to make it up and they walked in and they did Paranoid, you know, by copying communications breakdown, you know, it's, a, it's a basically a jam on communication breakdown, change the riff a bit, you know, Ozzy comes and sings some lyrics. And because that becomes a hit record, they call the album Paranoid, thus taking this awful representation of a, of, of a warrior and completely putting it out of context. So as a kid, I would, um, I would look at this album cover and go, is that bloke Paranoid? How is that man paranoid? Is he, is he having a paranoid delusion? Which is why he's dressed up so stupidly and got out into the forest and now he's leaping out of me in a sort of psychotic delusion and he's going to kill me because of his mental health. That's what I thought. And uh, in a way, it does fit better than it does war pigs because it at least ex explains the ridiculous attire. You know, how... I, how Ozzy and Geezer and Tony and Bill thought that that guy looked like a sort of army soldier with that outfit, I do not know. I do not know what he looks like. And then he's, he's sort of, they've done, I think when they photographed it, they've used a flash and they've used a longer explosion. They flash three times to get that sort of effect. I think that's, that's how they've done that. It's just rubbish in it. It's so ubiquitous that you don't even notice it. This is the thing about success. If you have success, then you become blind to the actual aspects of that success. It's really odd. But that's a very philosophical thing. And this video isn't philosophical. I'm down to my 10th album, the last album, and I've, I've saved, saved a truly album, a truly terrible album to last. And it is a progressive, well, sort of a progressive rock album. It's um, this album, Rock and Roll Prophet by Rick Wakeman, a crap album. 
So, um, in 1984, I was doing my work experience in Worcester at a graphic design place. And I remember going out at dinner time and going down to the local record shop. And this album was so crap that it was on sale for 99p. And I thought, oh, it's Rick Wakeman, he's from here. And I bought it and I took it home. And when I put it on, I realised why it was 99p. Um, it's pretty rubbish. But um, when I took it back to the graphic design place, the two older guys that were in there, um, who were graphic designers and knew what they were doing, they started laughing at this album cover. All right? Now, what we have here is truly questionable on every single level. Right? Um, Rick has tried to set up a scene. All right? Um, they've set it up in some sort of white studio. So what are we... What, what are we representing here? We have uh, Rick Waitman dressed in a gold lame, gold sparkly, um, what would you call that? It's like Demis Rousseff. What did Demis use to, not kaftan, it's a kaftan. It's like a gold kaftan he's wearing, right? Uh, what's he holding in his hand? A piece of paper. Right, he's got a piece of paper he's holding his hand. So he starts like, what, what, what the hell does this mean? Right, he's sat there with a piece of paper. He's, he's looking very happy with himself as he gazes at the camera. He's next to two girls who um, have sat on a furry chair surrounded by toys. They're licking lollipops and they've got their sort of stockings have been wound down to their ankles. Next to that we have a hat stand and we have some more toys hanging off it. We have what, is that, is that just a blazer or is it a school uniform blazer? We think it's a school uniform because there's a, there's a child's cap hung next to it. And uh, the title says Rick Wakeman in an awful typeface, which if you've got, sort of got this medieval Rick Wakeman in red and then this sort of rock and roll with the N and just like everything's crap. It's got one, one um, apostrophe when it should have two. It's just utter crap. In green, it's crap. In this white space, it's crap. It just looks like it's cost, you know, about 50 quid to do to make this it looks like you know rick's probably pulled a whole ton of stuff off his house got some cuddly toys you know he's got a rag doll and he's got these two girls in uh licking the lollipops he's had to go and get a couple of lollipops for them to lick you know one girl's got glasses and a bow in her hair um this is just questionable in the extreme absolutely questionable uh of what rick is trying to get across on this with this album cover I I actually don't want to get into what he's trying to say now but is it between the legs of the second girl right and the, the, it is Paul McCartney's bass and um, the other girl who's looking at the camera She's got, uh, uh, is that an exercise book? So I'm assuming what we've got going on here, this is a, this, this Rick Waitman's classroom, right? Are these his pupils? Is he a prophet in the way that a teacher's a prophet? Rick, what were you thinking? What were you doing at this point? What drugs, you know, how much, how much were you drinking to think that this was a good idea? You know, it, it's, I mean, I, this video is supposed to be funny, but I, as I look at this, and the more I look at it, and then there's a school tie there. It's just dodgy, isn't it? They're all dodgy, aren't they? That era of rock and rollers, they're all dodgy, and nobody wants to say it, do they? Rick Wakeman has now become the sort of, perennial grumpy old man hasn't he very funny man who's who's known now now more for, as a raconteur than as a prog keyboard player um he i think existed as a solo career he existed totally on his charisma and uh, he, he, he sort of gaining some sort of cultural purchase um when i was a little kid i knew who rick Wakeman was 
I think because he was on the TV a lot. I didn't know what Yes was. I didn't know any of the other guys in progressive rock. I didn't know who Tony Banks was or any of those guys. But I knew who Rick Rakeman was, and he, and he seems to be trading on that at this point. Um, why, I do not know. But that's truly awful. Anyway, I've come to the end of this video. That was 10 more awful um, albums covers. I don't think they're as bad as some of the ones I've gone through in the past. I, you know, the, I, I, the Count Basie one, I think, is is now I know that. that I, I, I wish I hadn't put I think the, the rest of them are pretty awful, though, aren't they? Um, tell me what you think, you know. Um, some of you may love some of these album covers because with Paranoid going for the one in Hemisphere, so I've, I've gone for some pretty big albums there. If you like this video, like it. If you want to see some more stupid videos like this, then subscribe. Uh, and if you want to support me, you can go to my Patreon. The link's down below there. And if you want to not become a patron but still you know, support me financially, you can put a donation into my PayPal tip jar. The link's down there. And that is really helping me at the moment. I am done. We're finished. Blast it. That's done. And I'll see you on the next video.